Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third day of our symposium on education, advancing education in Muslim societies. For those of you who attended day one on Wednesday, day two yesterday, and today, thank you for being with us. We had a group of very exciting presentations, and today I promise you we will have the same intellectually stimulating discussions and presentations from our different universities and places. I would like to ask you to mute yourselves and uh, shut down your cameras. Uh, those who are speaking, I will call on you to start your cameras again when we uh, start the question and answer session. This is a symposium, I would like to make sure I repeat that for those who haven't attended yesterday or the day before. This symposium is organized and hosted by Dr. Sharuk Sirdiqui and his team from Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. This symposium is also sponsored by the International Institute of Islamic Thought. My name again to those who weren't in attendance with us the past few days, my name is Ilham Nasser. I am a senior researcher and director of the Human Development Program, part of Advancing Education in Muslim Societies Initiative of IIIT. This is the fourth annual symposium on Muslim philanthropy and civil society, and it's usually held in person and has its own education strand. This year we have parallel symposium going on, one on education and one on philanthropy. And I'm chairing the one on education and I will do that through Sunday. So this symposium will continue same time, noon Eastern time till 1.30 sharp today and through uh, Sunday. The symposium uh, or the presentations that you will hear were selected for their high quality and of course, for their relevance to advancing education in Muslim societies and education spheres in general. They will be converted into manuscripts that will be peer reviewed and prepared for publication in the Journal of Education in Muslim Societies, GEMS, which is a collaboration and a, a publication of the Indiana University Press and the IIIT. Each session today uh, has been pre-recorded and each session will run, will have three to four speakers. So every presentation in each session has been pre-recorded. We will follow the same format like the days before. Please, um, um, uh, Leo will play the pre-recorded presentations and please keep yourselves muted and your cameras off. And uh, we encourage you to use the chat function to pose your questions to the speakers as we go through these pre-recorded presentations. We are fortunate enough that our speakers are with us today and they will be available to answer the questions that I will pose to them out loud so everyone can hear them as we start the Q&A sessions. If you have a question or a comment that is of sensitive nature, please make sure to chat with me and uh, send it to me privately to the chair. Um, and again, my name is Ilham Nasser. You also see it on the screen. I think this um, will be another exciting uh, four presentations that we have today and another day of stimulating uh, engagements. So I would like to start with the first presentation we have with us today by Dr. Koram Hussein, the World Community of Islam and the Reimagining of Muslim America. Thank you. Thank you for joining me wherever you are in the world for this discussion of the World Community of Islam and the Reimagining of Muslim America. This is a conversation about the intersection of faith, agency, and belonging in the education of Muslim American children. In particular, I invite us to consider how evolving Islamic ideals coincide with evolving political ideals and notions of statehood, especially since American Islamic institutions are an important space where these ideals are perceived, conceived, and embodied. For this talk, I'd like to focus on the schools founded by the Nation of Islam, 
not only because they comprise one of the earliest and most widespread Islamic schooling systems in America, but also because they offer a window into how Islamic and political ideals encounter one another in America, and how notions of spiritual citizenship and territorial citizenship shape and reshape one another. First, let's take a step back and consider the wider context. On June 29, 1975, the largest Muslim movement in American history dramatically shifted course. As W.D. Muhammad ascended to lead the Nation of Islam, he abandoned his father's separatist black nationalist philosophy and promoted participation in American civic life. All of the organization's institutions underwent changes. The Nation of Islam was renamed the World Community of Islam in the West. Their prayer and educational spaces changed from being temples into mosques. The newspaper Muhammad Speaks was renamed Bilalian News, and the movement's primary schools once known as University of Islam schools, transitioned to Sister Clara Muhammad schools. Now, much emphasis regarding this transition has landed on the purportedly doctrinal transformations. Certainly, W.D. Muhammad moved the Nation of Islam away from the theological suppositions of his father, and in the view of many, joined the mainstream international community of Muslims. Religion scholar Sherman Jackson is described as a moment when W.D. Muhammad redirected the movement into Sunni Islam, thereby joining the chorus of immigrant Muslims that considered Elijah Muhammad's movement a pseudo-Islamic one. Historically, Elijah Muhammad had mixed success in his struggle to court both immigrant and black Sunni Muslims as allies in his movement. For decades, he was kept at arm's length by American immigrant Muslims. By contrast, W.D. Muhammad was publicly embraced by American immigrant Muslim community leaders. In remembrance of his passing in 2008, the Islamic Society of North America declared that Imam W.D. Muhammad had, quote, the singular honor of leading a centripetal movement of his community into mainstream Islam. Yet, what is less considered in such remarks is that W.D. Muhammad also shifted towards a different vision of political identity. In each area, the world community of Islam in the West tied Muslim identity development to new notions of civics. The political and religious principles of the Nation of Islam had framed black Muslims as being in America, but not American. They were a nation within a nation, focused on self-reliance, self-determination, and an active effort to survive anti-black racism, and the schools reflected that reality. The University of Islam centered its curriculum around notions of Muslim and black self, history, and agency. In the words of University of Islam principal Christine Johnson X, quote, let them see black, brown, cream, and yellow faces when they open their books. Let them become accustomed early in life to the idea that they have something to strive for. Let them early in life know that they have a history with meaning and not a meaningless, nebulous something about Negro history and how much progress we have made since slavery. It was essential that this kind of education occur in a space where there was a capacity for authorship and there was a fundamental mistrust that there would be a capacity for evolution within public schools. The public schools would continue to serve as sites for assimilation. And so this was not only an act of self-determination of a proactive kind, it was also an act of survival. Furthermore, there was throughout the curriculum and teaching within the University of Islam schools, a notion that was steeped that Muslim identity was separate from American identity and one's religious duty was to serve that nation within the nation and discourage direct service to the American nation state. In the words of Elijah Muhammad, and his words were often used in the curriculum in the Nation of Islam schools, he says, quote, you are not American citizens. So why fight a losing battle? 
by trying to be recognized as something you are not and never will be. I am not trying to disillusion you. I'm merely telling you the truth. So in this context, the transition of the world community of Islam in the West is stark. When hundreds of Sister Clara Muhammad schools in the mid-1970s established new practices that are now repeated by many Islamic schooling systems today, including greater local autonomy and an emphasis on formal Arabic recitation and Islamic studies within social studies. But there also emerged a body of social studies that not only focused on the agency of Muslims as historical actors, but also their agency as American historical actors. The teachings of W.D. Muhammad, which were a part of the school's curriculum, offer insight here. In a speech he gave uh, titled, A Healthy Patriotism, he says, quote, look at the longevity of this country, this form of government we have. Look at how it survived when governments all over the world are failing. It is not because it has been so righteous. It is because it has been blessed with the sacred knowledge of how to form a government life of a people, of a government under God. He continues now highlighting the profound impact of Muslim African Americans. That is the Muslims in the United States of America. And they were here while others were mum and afraid to speak. This is Independence Day. And I'm inviting you to come to my meaning of patriotism and walk these streets and know that they belong to you as much as they belong to any man and see your future in this country and believe that the world is open to you as much as is open to any man. This ethic of civic engagement positioned the world community of Islam in the West at the forefront of engaging Sunni Muslims in the ideals of civics as Islamic. So it's not a surprise uh, the principal of a Clara Muhammad school in Philadelphia, uh, someone by the name of Haja Saeed Kway, played a meaningful role in the inaugural White House Eve dinner hosted by then First Lady Hillary Clinton. Quay, as a principal in Philadelphia, had met Hillary Clinton at the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing and continued to forward a principal ideal of elevating Muslim American visibility at every level of public life, including in the White House. And that historical moment can't be divorced from the context of the Clara Muhammad School of Philadelphia. Yes, it was a school, like many Clara Muhammad schools across the country, that taught Arabic, Islamic studies, and Quranic recitation. Yet it was also a school where children recited the Pledge of Allegiance, hosted law enforcement to promote racial amity, and alums went on to participate in civil service, including armed service and public office. Moreover, Clara Muhammad schools were responsive to Muslim necessities substantiated by lived Muslim experiences and dedicated to Muslim engagement at not only religious, but also civic levels of their development as Muslims. So keeping within my time, I'll, I'll close here in hopes of continuing the conversation with the following considerations. I believe that this leaves us, this story in particular, with an understanding of the role Islamic schooling has in a manner that many immigrant founded Islamic schools did not fully embrace until after 9-11. While civic education entails a remaking of Muslim identity, it is not presupposed to be an assimilationist and ultimately an existential threat to Muslim Americans, at least not from the vantage point of the Clara Muhammad schools. The Clara Muhammad schools put their faith not only in Islam, but also in the capacity for America to retain its principles of democratic pluralism and religious tolerance and religious pluralism where being Muslim does not come at the cost of being American. Ultimately, when we move our focus away from doctrine and look at civic education and African-American Islamic schools, we see 
that instead of dismissing schooling systems like the Clara Muhammad schools as late doctrinal adapters to Sunni Islam, they were the vanguard of an integrated Islamic education in America. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I hope that uh, um, Dr. Kuram is with us. Uh, we will find out later. Our set, uh, second presentation is on sense of belonging among Muslim immigrants, college students in America. The second presentation will keep us within the U.S. context and will be presented by Dr. Muhammad al his Thank you. Hello, my name is Muhammad al his and I am a doctor student at the University of Idaho. I am so excited to be part of the symposium this year. Um, my topic today is about sense of belonging. Um, I'm very interested in topics related to um, experiences of international students and immigrant students abroad. So um, um, for the topic today, I am trying to investigate the sense of belonging for 24 immigrant students from Muslim from Muslim background from Iraq, from Syria and Libya. Unfortunately, uh, because of the pandemic, I couldn't interview all the participants. So today I'm going to share with you the only population that I managed to interview, which is the Libyan students. And hopefully next year, the beginning of next year, I'll be able to finish the interviews with the other populations from Syria and Iraq. Okay, thank you. So let's start. All right, so I'm going to start with the problem statement here. Um, being Muslim and immigrant myself had a great influence on choosing this topic, um, particularly the climate, the current climate, political climate. Um, as we all know, the decisions, the political decisions, such as the Muslim travel ban, the visa restrictions, uh, issues with the green card procedures that targeted uh, Muslim students had a great had actually negative impact on these students. The research, research showed that the students feel, Muslim students feel um, feelings of frustration, distrust, and unwelcome in America. And as a result, it had impacted their sense of belonging. The second reason here I mentioned is that, um, that these students unfortunately do not receive uh, support from universities. And here, um, I have one of the examples here in 2011, and this happened actually to a group of Libyan students um, they, when they lost their scholarship as a result to um, the Arab Spring and what happened back home, they didn't receive support from the university. And therefore, I am so interested to learn more about these students and their experiences and how this impact their sense of belonging. So I'm going to start here with the definition of sense of belonging. Sense of belonging is the feeling of being cared about, accepted, respected, and valued by a group. And here I like this definition and I highlighted um, important parts here in the second definition here, which is the valid involvement and feeling fitting in. I'm also using sense of belonging as the theoretical framework for this paper. Um, but the question here is that where do we find sense of belonging? How do we develop sense of belonging? Um, according to research, we develop sense of belonging in two important or essential constructs, academic integration and social integration. And I'm going to introduce these two terms in the next slide. So academic integration refers to a student's feeling of being involved in their institutional academic practices. So in other words, academic integration related to anything that happened inside the classroom. For example, working with groups, doing homework, searching online for their homework, or interacting with professors, interacting with peers, or um, asking questions in class. So anything related to the academia is considered academic integration, as opposed to um, social integration. And social integration is feeling of connected with people outside of the classroom. Um, for example, 
uh, students can make friends, can um, have parties on campus, can join clubs, can go to the rec center, doing things on the free time. So all of these things that students do outside the classroom is considered social integration. And this example help this, these examples help the students develop sense of belonging. So here we talked about two examples. We talked about academic integration, which talks about the um, the things that students do in, for academic purposes, and social integration, things that students do for the purpose of social integration to make friends and spend time on campus. And these two things help the students develop sense of belonging. And therefore, my research question is, how do Muslim immigrant students experience a sense of belonging in America? And as I mentioned at the beginning of the um, presentation, because of um, COVID-19, unfortunately, I could interview students from um, uh, Iraq and Syria, but I'm still in the process right now. I arrange the interviews with them. So, so far, I collected data from Libyan students. And uh, for, the, for this presentation, my data comes from only one population from Libyan immigrant students. So I interviewed six Libyan students in a rural university in the Pacific Northwest region of America. And I used interviews for data collection. So for the participants, um, the Libyan participants, they came to America in 2017, and a couple of them came in 2018. And once they came here, they changed their visa from being an international student into a asylee. Or, and some of them actually still in the process of applying for asylum. And the reason they apply for asylum is because the instability back home and they they can't go back home after they finish their studies so and uh, another thing here in the study i uh, i chose students who spent at least two years in america because research so showed that students who spend at least two years in america in, in a foreign context they experience some kind of social and academic integration um, so i conducted three interviews the interviews took place at the end of last year, in fall 2019, and to a couple of them in um, spring 2020. And um, some of them took place in the library of the university, and some of them took place through um, Zoom because of you know COVID-19. All the interviews conducted in Arabic because the students preferred to be uh, question in Arabic. And then I translated the data from Arabic to English. And for the interview questions, I asked um, each participant 10 questions, five questions for the academic integration. And um, these questions are related to their experience as students on campus, um, their experiences with their uh, peers, with their advisors, with their faculty, um, the, you know, studying, um, challenges as student. For the social integration, I ask questions for things that students do outside of the classroom. Um, for example, one of the questions here, um, number three, describe relationship with your faculty and classmates outside the classroom. And uh, here I want to know how they built relationship uh, with people on campus. Another question, describe your friends on campus. If any, how do you think this relationship influenced your sense of connection to university? So again, um, these questions related to how they social integrate to um, the community on campus. And for the data analysis here, I use the grounded theory, inductive, then deductive approach. Um, I also use the constant comparative paradigm, and I use my memo memos during the analysis. And here, um, here in the picture, um, I'm explaining what I exactly did. I first had the interviews, and then I created actually a portfolio for each participant and important quotes from the interviews. 
and then I had the open coding and for the open coding I started to categorize and look for quotes that match the academic and social integration and then after finishing this process I had the exile coding um, and this one this process is very very dynamic because um, I had to look for codes that match the academic and social integration. I had to delete codes. I had to combine codes until I go to the final stage, which is the selective coding. And for this stage, I decided on the codes that I uh, I believe match the um, the social and academic integration. And during all this process, I used my memos uh, to help to guide me to look for um, relationship between the codes. So here, uh, an example of the inductive coding that I did at the, at the beginning of the data analysis. I first, as I mentioned, I, I created a portfolio for each participant and I um, read the interviews looking for any codes that match the academic and social integration and I created a table and after that I coded each um, codes according to the priori code codes which is the academic or social integration. So for the findings um, so far three themes emerged and hopefully after finish interviewing um, the other participants from Syria and Iraq probably I will come up with more themes. So the first theme here is language barrier. Um, all students expressed their frustration because they felt like English was a main obstacle for their social and academic integration. Um, for example, here the first two codes here, they talk about that language um, was a main hindrance for making friends because they were worried about how they will interact with American students inside and outside the classroom. Um, the third and the fourth code here um, affected their academic integration. They, some of the students complained of uh, inability to write a proposal for a conference to um, one of them actually rejected um, a book chapter work on, on a book chapter with the professor because he was worried about their language, um, his English language. Um, the fourth one was a couple of students expressed the frustration because they felt like they were assessed like native speaker um, and felt this is kind of like injustice for them. Um, the second theme that emerged is teacher pedagogy. And what I mean by teacher pedagogy here is that the students didn't feel they were engaged in class, mainly for two reasons. The first reason was um, the students felt like they, most of the activities that they work on or the courses that are taking lack the, um, or the structure, actually the structure of the courses they, that they enrolled in were, were lacked the, um, that link between outside of classroom and what they are doing inside of the classroom. For example, one of the students was working, was doing her um, practicum and she said that while in class we talk about things, but when I went and observed the students and uh, work with teachers, I didn't feel like the courses I'm taking in college helped me prepare to, um, to do or finish my practicum outside the classroom. The second thing they talked about was lacking creativity. They felt like most, most courses they are taking were look alike, the same structure, the same, um, the syllabus are the same. Um, teachers are doing kind of like lectures more than having the students interact with each other or social interaction in class. So for these two reasons, they, they felt like when well, they were not engaged in class, and affected their academic integration and as a result they didn't feel like they belonged. Um, the third theme that emerged was finding a place to belong. Um, although there were challenges 
that the students that they had to face and impacted their sense of belonging. There were there are two things they talked about that played a role for their um, in their uh, academic and social integration, and, and as a result, helped them develop some kind of sense of belonging. These two things were um, evident in two places. The first place was um, in the at the international center. They were able to build relationships with students over there, inter particularly international students and Muslim, other Muslim, Muslim students. And here one of the exams they talked about is that during this um, interaction with the students, they talked about uh, important topics related to them. For example, how to file a tax or how to find a cheaper place to live or where place to get halal meat. The other, and this is kind of like related to social integration. For the academic integration, they talked about, about the relationship with the faculty and that um, and describe them as caring faculty because they helped them during when they first arrived to America and helped them with their, um, for example, asylum process. And um, they described these kind of su um, support as very, very uh, important for developing sense of belonging. So for the themes that emerged so far, only three. But uh, I'm sure after I finish my uh, interviews with the um, Iraqi and Syrian participants, I will come up with more data. And as a result, I'll come up with other codes and themes. So so for, for the purpose of this study, I only have three themes for that emerged from my interviews with the Libyan students. Uh, so although the, the Libyan students here, they yearn to fit in and feel belong, however, the being non-native speaker and the lack of resources had impacted their uh, sense of belonging. They felt they were uh, left out and valued and lost because of several reasons. One of the reason is the language barrier. The language barrier not only they uh, have issues with, you know, um, writing an assignment or interaction in class, but they developed some kind of feelings like feeling powerless or deprived or disabled. All these um, things make students feel like they can't socially and academically integrate and as a result impacted their sense of belonging. Um, another thing was the uh, the teacher pedagogy, the 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 idea of not uh, feeling engaged in class has a great influence on students' academic and social uh, academic integration. I would say, because they don't feel like they can um, they can uh, make sense of the curriculum, make sense of what they're gonna face outside the classroom, and as a result, they feel like well. We are wasting our time here. I mean, these things, these courses we are taking are un unproductive, do not pr prepare us for the real world. As a result, they don't feel sense of belonging. And the last thing was that, um, that they were, although they were um, kind of um, support and uh, resources to help them sense of belonging, such as the caring faculty or a place to go to and uh, interact with other international students, still their sense of belonging was not really strong. Um, they felt like, well, it was only uh, temporary, uh, only for just for a short time. And thank you very, very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, um, Mohammed al Hess. And uh, Dr. Shelley Wang and uh, Tui Tu from George Mason University will take us to the Palestinian Occupied West Bank with a study on international education and civil society activism in the Palestinian Occupied West Bank. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to participate in this symposium on Muslim philanthropy and civil society. My name is Shelley Wong and my co-presenter is Tui Du. 
The title of our paper is International Education and Civil Society Activism in the Palestinian Occupied West Bank. This presentation describes the journey of four international students from Australia, France, Germany, and Japan who were enrolled in the Palestinian and Arabic Studies program at Knowledge Hub University, a leading university in the occupied West Bank. In our presentation, we will focus on sharing international student changing perspectives as they came to understand Palestinian culture and society through a dialogic curriculum, which exposed students not only to in-class language intensive Arabic language lessons, readings and discussions, but also provided a strong field trip component to expose students to many different Palestinian voices under Israeli occupation. PASS, which stands for Palestinian Arabic Studies, is an intensive Arabic language program for international students to study modern standard Arabic and Palestinian colloquial Arabic as well as as contemporary Arabic thought. Faculty curriculum designers emphasize learning by doing. That is, the connections between traditional in-class, more formal instructional components of curriculum, such as course readings, lectures, discussions, and assignments, and the out-of-class, after-school or weekend activities organized by educational institutions such as sports events or competitions, debating clubs, performance arts, and field trips. International students in the PASS for Palestinian Arabic Studies program during the 2018 to 2000 academic year were from elite public and private universities from Algeria, Australia, Canada, Chile, England, France, Germany, Japan, Korea, Mexico, the Netherlands, Norway, Scotland, Spain, Sweden, and the US. In the year before, Israeli authorities denied or significantly delayed issuing visas to 15 of the Knowledge Hub University faculty with foreign passports, resulting in undue anxiety and uncertainty for both individual faculty and their students. Through the field trips in a single day, students were exposed to a plethora of experiences which required them to respond to a range of information about history and current realities within a very packed or full itinerary. For example, in the trip to South Heat, students were provided with the opportunity to see the reality of Israeli settlements on the ground. They were given the opportunity to participate in discussion and mini lessons about groundwater issues, agriculture, Israeli industrial zones, and the apartheid wall. An important aspect of curriculum in international education is self-awareness on the part of the student's own positions of privilege within global systems of empire and extreme differences in wealth and power. Desiring that their students go from being tourists to a more critical and dialogic engagement with the local people they encounter in the host society, faculty designed assignments which asked their students to take an anthropological approach, that is, go beyond their previous stereotypes and to make the foreign or strange familiar. An important cross-cultural or intercultural goal for international students is to enable students to reflect upon their own familiar, taken for granted cultural biases, attitudes and beliefs, and to step out of their own subjectivity, reflect on, notice or develop an appreciation for the host societal mores, customs, and guide them to higher levels of thinking. The overarching 
research question was to explore what international students discovered through these field trips. This ex included student estimation of what they learned, their perspectives concerning the value of their field experiences and their insights uh, they gained through learning by doing. The four international students who are featured in this particular study were from France, Australia, Germany, and Japan. Three were undergraduates and one was a graduate student. They were all full-time students of Arabic language in the PASS program at Knowledge Hub University. The four interviews were conducted in March 2018 and varied from 25 minutes to an hour and six minutes. These international students were asked to reflect on what they had learned, experienced, and discovered on their field trips. Their dialogue with people from diverse communities in civil society and different walks of life. We have adapted the four stages of transformative learning from peace pilgrimages as outlined by um, Professor Thomas Shiro and pro provided the descriptions of each stage based on our analysis of interviews with students. An example of stage one, a disorienting or dilemma can be seen through the example of Bruce, a Palestinian heritage language learner from Australia. The trip to the actual separation wall that helped him come to know what he had previously read about in new ways. This critical discovery or insight has been described elsewhere in descriptions of curriculum transformation as an awakening. S stage two, in the second stage, which is described as questioning and deconstruction, an example is provided by Maxime, the student from France, who asked the professor many questions after being able to observe the Israeli settlements. This opportunity to ask questions avoided him, afforded him insights. The third stage of the transformative framework is to reframe and restructure for a deeper understanding. Each of the students expressed appreciation for the opportunity to pose questions and gain insights that enabled them to reframe and restructure Palestinian insider perspectives that they would not ordinarily be able to encounter if they were only tourists. Students experience disorienting dilemmas which caused them to reframe and restructure what they had previously known about. Students went from being tourists, shopping and tasting Palestinian specialties, uh, wonderful desserts, to visiting the home of a family who refused to move, although their lands were being confiscated all around them and the wall was built, built right next to their house. In a single day the house was uh, the wall was erected this required reframing and restructuring to understand the historical processes that had taken place over decades with israeli separation policies they observed ghost towns with homes and businesses abandoned when palestinians due to the closing off of roads were no longer able to travel to jerusalem to live and to work witness bearing of intense suffering may involve an awakening to one's connection with those who have experienced tragedy, marginalization, or oppression. This involves a transcendence from pity to empathy and to a deeper systemic and structural analysis of what they witness. In the fourth stage, a shift in consciousness occurs as students become a catalyst for change within themselves 
and others. This transcendence was not in, um, apparent in all of the students who studied in the program. And the, the question that's posed by this research is how is it that some students are able to move from victimhood to a deeper systemic understanding, from why to dedicating themselves to become part of the solution through activism. Thank you. We look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Wang. Thank you. And our last presentation for today, but not least, is going to um, take us to, um, to Pakistani University. The title of the presentation is Investigating Individual Growth and Change Results from an Internationalization Project in a Pakistani University by Dr. Uh, Becky Fox and her team, Wumi Kim and Tariq Mehdi. Thank you very much. Welcome. And thank you for this very special opportunity to share the results of our research here at the Muslim Philanthropy Symposium. I'm Becky Fox, and I'm here with my co-presenters and researchers, Umi Kim and Tarek Midi, to share the results from a phenomenological study entitled, Investigating Individual Growth and Change as a Result of International Professional Learning in Pakistani Higher Education. Research has the potential to take us beyond program evaluation to consider enduring learning from international projects and contribute to a global dialogue with colleagues across the world. In this study, we sought to understand more deeply the experiences of three Pakistani faculty members who participated in this three-year project. Our study has a fourfold purpose aiming to more deeply understand multiple areas of the three Pakistani higher education faculty participants' experiences. First, how they experienced and transferred their understanding of this project to, to, um, to their local, how they experienced an internationalization and navigated between the global and the local to the rapidly changing environment that is Pakistan today. Third, what their application and the sustainability of this project were. And last, in what ways such experiences on individuals could extend beyond the scope of merely applying or implementing a Western status quo into their university practice. We believe that our audience is broad, higher education institutions in the US and abroad, grant funding agencies, exchange programs, and most importantly, researchers who are seeking to understand the impact, legacy, and sustainability of such international projects. The Collaboration for Faculty Excellence in Teaching and Research was funded by the US-Pakistan University Partnerships Program of the US Department of State Public Affairs Section in the US Embassy in Islam. There are three major components which I will present briefly here. First, partnerships. This three-year research and te teaching partnership grant is the context. Collaboration, which involved 40 faculty from the Pakistani University, with three specifically selected for this study. Experience. The experiences were both online and face-to-face. -face. The Pakistani faculty came to the US University for on-site seminars and then follow on work that included personal action plans for research and educational change upon return to Pakistan. The US project faculty also traveled to Pakistan for extended work and to facilitate the project's culminating conference. I'm Rebecca Fox, and I am a professor in the, of education in the College of Education and Human Development at George Mason University. With a bicultural and bilingual background, a large part of my research focuses on culture, second language acquisition research, and critical reflection. Hello, my name is Umi Kim, and I'm a doctoral candidate at George Mason University. And I had the privilege of interviewing two of our participants. And I bring in multiple and unique perspectives to the study as a woman, an immigrant, 
a first generation college graduate and bilingual and bicultural Asian American. It's very nice to meet you all. Hi, my name is Tariq Mehdi and I was born and raised in Bangladesh. I have worked extensively in the developing sectors with local and international NGOs and I'm now pursuing my PhD at George Mason University. As you can see, all of us are multicultural in our heritage and upbringings. Coming from a similar demographic area in Southeast Asia, I was able to offer insider perspectives based on my lived experiences. Through our individual lived experiences, we share Western, Eastern, East Asian, South Asian education and cultures. These identities gave us unique opportunities to analyze the data from multiple perspectives. We employed a phenomenological approach to understand the influences of an internationalization project on three Pakistani faculty led by the following research question. Number one, how do three Pakistani faculty members portray their learning and experiences and what aspects of the project do they consider as being the most influential individually and institutionally? Number two, what are the overarching themes that emerge from the interview data collected during the program and one year post program that captured the lived experiences and influences of this internationalization project. As we mentioned before, we employed a phenomenological approach because it is particularly well suited for exploring human experiences and the meanings human beings attribute to those experiences. Through purposeful and convenient se selection, three faculty from 40 Pakistani faculty fellows participating in the project shared their lived experiences. We had used pseudonyms throughout the study to protect the identity of the participants. The primary data sources for us are individual interviews conducted at the beginning, middle, and one year after completing the US best component of the program. Each interview lasted 60 minutes, then were recorded and transcribed. We used open and axial coding to review and analyze the data. Each of us first coded the emerging themes in a single participant's interview data, then we collected the analyzed data to determine crossover themes. Next, we gather to discuss the data and begin categorizing themes from initial findings. After our group discussions, we individually reviewed the data to determine consistency of the emerging themes across the collective findings. And from the very start of this project and research, we as researchers committed toward taking critical perspectives on internationalization. And what that entailed was to promote the spirit of collaboration mutual respect, concern for social justice, and a call to global civic responsibility. And so also maintain, maintaining an equitable playing field between the researchers and participants was important in order to foster intercultural competence for all parties involved. And so we understood that if the global subsumes the local, the full context will be lost. So on the other hand, when the local sociocultural lens is maintained and respected, the global can be viewed from a humanist perspective where the universalizing involves global citizenship and in international mindedness. In response to research question one, we first pre present each participant as a mini portrait in order to portray the ways in which each participant uniquely and personally experienced the program. We continue to use the critical lens that Umi just uh, shared with you that uh, was the driver of the entire project and this research. Our first portrait is of Professor Zanzida. From her own words, her portrait is entitled, The Change is First Within You and Then the Possibilities Come. She was an associate professor and a leader in her department at that university. As a single woman, she had never had the opportunity to travel outside Pakistan prior to this project. She was confident of her scholarship. She held a PhD and yet wondered how she was going to manage all of this. How am I going to survive two weeks with these strangers whom I don't know actually? She managed to overcome any uh, doubts and particularly her initial doubts by turning toward her students. She really focused on the application of new knowledge, her teaching expanded research. Change was a theme that appeared across all of her interview data and it remained salient upon her return to Pakistan and then upon her third year 
um, as a Fulbright Scholar. Ta she talked about change and change needing to be first within herself and then she could activate it. She projected possibilities for many changes in teaching, practice, and research, change for her students, and change in her program's outreach. Our second uh, portrait features Professor Aisha, and she's an assistant professor and director of Teaching and Learning Center at her university. And she often spoke about her vision for collaboration during the interviews. She articulated what cultivating a culture of collaboration might look like at the center. And she sought opportunities to collaborate, learn and expand the center's capacities and realize that the center's professional offerings only could be achieved in collaboration rather than needing to do everything by herself. So upon return to Pakistan, Professor Aisha moved her vision into reality through collaboration with colleagues to create a faculty professional workshops. And seeing the model of collaboration among our faculty from the program experience, she reached out to colleagues across disciplines to collaborate and facilitate a series of successful faculty development for all faculty at her institution. And Professor Aisha shared how proudly how her vision of collaboration was being actualized and also how these enactments are actively promoting the growth and development of the teaching and the learning center at her university. The next participant is Professor Amu. Professor Amu is an assistant professor who previously spent time during university and graduate school in the US. All his three interviews included robust evidence of the ways he visions for action and enactment in his classes, his programs at the university. Although he had spent time in the US, he reported that he experienced this project through new lenses. Seminars and active discussions here advanced his thinking on local and international dynamics, power in higher education, cultural challenges and triumphs, and the institutional and social mindset in the local context. Upon return to Pakistan, he engaged his colleagues and students collaborate, collab I'm sorry, collaboratively in research and used new interactive teaching practices. His vision called him to action, integrating the international and the local. And through the cross-participant analysis, uh, six overarching themes emerged, which capture their lived experiences and influences of this internationalization project. And as you can see in this slide, the themes are inspiration, collaboration, transformation, empowerment, culture, and reflection. And for the sake of time, I will explain three with examples. Inspiration emerged as a theme when we saw how each participant became a source of inspiration to those around, both professionally and personally. And for someone like Professor Aisha, being the director of a center as a female, she noted how she has become an inspiration for other women, uh, for them to also pursue and achieve to lead in places that were traditionally not possible as women. And for personally, she became someone the younger generation in her family and especially girls could look up to and strive to emulate. And next, transformation emerged as another important theme which evidence revealed how each professor went beyond what was expected of them to achieve, not only in research and practice, but in personal pursuits. And as you heard already from uh, Portraiture One, for Professor Sanzita, after returning to Pakistan, she sought for research fellowships on her own to further explore her capacities as a scholar in the international arena. And on her own, she pursued and achieved Fulbright scholarship and returned to the US for one year to expand her professional career by collaborating internationally, internationally as a visiting scholar to a US institution in her field. And she has indeed experienced that change within and acted upon that agency to advance her scholarship internationally. And lastly, culture emerged as a theme as the project experience uh, enabled participants 
to recognize complex cultural aspects and nuances about the US, the higher education and their own culture that they'd not realized before. And so for Professor Amir, realizing that his students need to expand their learning capabilities from teacher-centered to learner-centered, brought in pedagogies that cultivated the students to become co-constructors of knowledge. He also emphasized the need for his students to be equipped to face the 21st century globalized context and challenges by implementing the instructional practices that prepare his university students in the business program for the real world. From individual portraiture through cross-cultural or cross-participant uh, themes to now looking at what are some of the transcending messages that might be drawn from this research. And we have, we've pinpointed three of them, sustainability, legacy, and making a difference. Sustainability of the project goals and objectives and individuals' um, participation were born of the development of a mindset toward collaboration that was forged. The legacy of the project was for, is forged in the development of a mindset toward teamwork through research and a center for teaching and learning that was not previously an element of this university's culture. And finally, making a difference. It forged, it provided an opportunity for global to local in support of the development of each individual's response to new thinking and with new lenses, creating individual change in research, critical reflection, and their teaching practice. This concludes our presentation. We have so much we would like to share, but for today, we would like to say merci tellement. In Bengali, we say dhunnabad. Thank you. We welcome your questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I would like to remind you all that we have pasted in the chat the link to the survey, I mean, to the survey to evaluate today's session. It will be very valuable to our speakers if they can get feedback from you. Uh, so uh, if Lina, you don't mind pasting that link again um, in the chat as well. So it, it, it's only three, four questions. It's not a comprehensive uh, uh, evaluation, but it will give us some ideas. Thank you, Lina. Now I would like to open the Q&A and we will have about 20 minutes to do that. If uh, you don't mind our speakers, you can unmute yourselves. And I think you can also show your cameras if you are willing to do that and you know it's it's really a choice but it would be nice to see some faces behind the names and the pre-recorded the presentations um you know i think in the in the chat we had a few questions one of them came to me but you know in the for the sake of the topic of this session today all about this whole idea of transformative learning whether it's in the sense of belonging or being part of the fabric of the American society as Muslims in America or in the Pakistani project where the idea was really to see what, 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 what changed in people's experiences as faculty in higher education. And then the idea behind the international students who were part of this program in Palestine where learning is not only about tourism, but it's be, you know it's transforming the person. So I'm trying to bring all of these different themes together and hear from any of our speakers. You know, how much how much do you think that your projects um, brought this transformative learning to light, and what needs to happen for? all of us who are involved in international education, what needs to happen to make that more of a reality and go beyond your studies? I, I hope I'm making sense. I'm trying to pose a broad question that everyone can relate to from your own areas of research. What, what needs to happen to us to, to learn from these experiences that could be scaled up, could be expanded, could be, you know, um, even with the topic on, um, 
sense of belonging, we are conducting our own research at the at triple IT and we actually looked at sense of belonging as an important component of of learning and well being and um, there's a lot there too, whether it's academic or social. Is it part of the transformative learning apparatus and so I'll leave it open to anyone who would like to take this on. Um, Il Ilham, I actually just wanted to uh, add to your, your, your rich question um, that uh, I, I, I was really struck. I thought that each of the presentations uh, was uh, textured and, and, and offered uh, a, a number of layers that wove together um, pedagogy, curriculum, context, geography, and, and social identity. And, and so I think one of the things that really struck me was that we, we bring our whole selves uh, into, into learning. And so as, as we go through identity development, um, so do our classes, so do our students, so does our curriculum, so do our schools. And so I think that there was a kind of availability and vulnerability of self and identity, which is changing um, underneath the forces of politics, geography, and, and, and historical change. And, and so I, I just saw that thread through each was that, you know, we, we can't sort of see the subject object relationship between the, the educator or the, the system and the student. And, and I, just, I, I just really want to acknowledge that, that, that the transformative capacity of being that present with our full selves as, as educators, administrators, as organizers of entire educational systems, that we, we are mirroring ourselves in, in the schools. And as much as we can be um, honest and thoughtful and explore that, um, I think we can look at the transformative capacity of um, Islamic education moving forward. Yes, I, I, and I, I think that the, um, the researcher in this story is what you're trying to point out. Our, you know, being, our identity as researcher is what, what comes through as well. Definitely. Thank you for that intervention. I'd love to respond or at least start out the response. And thank you so much for that observation. Um, it's so hard sometimes to put in words what transformation means with regard to a three-year project, right? And, and the nuances of understanding on both sides um, are, are just phenomenal. I think opening a project, creating a project such as, you know, this one, this three-year study or project that, that we did in Pakistan, um, you, you set the parameters, but it becomes much more than that. It opens doors and then it enables everyone who participates to transform and to change. And so we share the best of what we have that is received with the best that others have. And in that process of reactivation, all of the learning then um, takes its own shape. And so the, the participants in one of our three who, who was highlighted, said, I had to return to Pakistan to talk with my students, to try out with my students. And we all learned together and created new possibilities. And that is what we're looking for. Um, I noticed that we also have with us today one of the, the people who traveled with us to Pakistan as part of this project. And I think I can, I can speak for Karen when I say we all changed as a result of this and will be forever changed because of it. So being able to find the words and find the means to, to um, convey the sustainability and the legacy of what was achieved, which also needed to include face-to-face -face time in both spaces was hugely important to the success of this project, but it was only successful because of all the people who were involved in it. So I guess that's just a beginning of opening the door of what I might say, because I could go on and on. <laughs> 
Wonderful. Thank you, Becky. Sally? Well, I was also struck by the themes running throughout the papers today and am um, very excited about um, the, ex the particularly this uh, theme of belonging and what, how we are able to, um, what that means. Um, the, um, in the case of um, Libyan students who are asylum seekers, that um, the very um, challenge of um, under the Muslim ban is um, really, um, to me, has so much, um, there's such a connection between that and, and the study of the international students in Palestine who uh, due to occupation um, could even were not allowed to study. So all this, uh, when I think about uh, what transformation means over a three year plan and the, the wonderful resource that is enabled when you have those resources for collaboration um, in contrast to some of the challenges of not being able due to security, due to, uh, to even connect, reconnect. Um, and so I'll, I'll just um, point out that um, the, some of, in, encourage um, this study of um, Muslim students who are under attack for the intersectionality of language, um, stereotypes, uh, bias, hatred, and uh, the policies that are continuing. Um, that this uh, more work in this area and thinking about how um, I, I like what Ume said about the importance of not allowing the um, the global. Um, I, th I think she was referring to more the head, head, what is the responsibility of us who are working in US institutions to really uh, utilize our positions uh, to support those who are, um, how do we do that in a non um, um, hegemonic way to give those uh, space for the local voices. Tweed, I, I didn't get a chance to um, introduce um, Tweed Do. If you'd like to add anything, um, uh, perhaps later, I wanted to introduce Twee as well to our conversation. Yeah, and, and I think that's the, the one of my biggest question is what you asked uh, Shelley about, you know, how much can someone who comes to the US and feels, you know, one of the comments was if foreign students they don't feel belonging here because they don't belong here but you know but but i don't know if i would call them foreign but let's say international students who come to the us take the ideas that fit their own context and not to be imposing as you as faculty like researchers not to impose on people um, that come from other places our own values and even in research and uh, academic inquiries and so forth the sense of belonging question, um, I don't know if our speaker is with us about the sense of belonging of the Libyan student, but there was, was a question for him. And I think he's here, but I don't see his picture. Oh, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> so um, the question is that between academic, I think follow our conversation, the intersection, one of the questions was how, the, is there an intersection between the academic sense of belonging and the social sense of belonging? I think that we saw from all presentations that a sense of uh, transformation only happens when you experience it yourself, whether you're the researcher or the student or the faculty or whoever. So is there a, 
a place where these two intersect in, in your study? And I know you're at the beginning of this study, uh, so I think that's a question particular for you. Okay, thank you very much. I enjoyed listening to all the presentations today. Thank you very much. Um, well, as you all said, it, uh, sense of belonging is a need. It's like in Maslow pyramid, we're all aware of the one of the needs is like, you know, uh, food and shelter. Um, I want to clarify things before talking about the difference between academic and, and social integration is that they actually they are not foreign students and they are not considered as international students. And this is why interested me is that they came here as international students, but because what happened back home, they changed their status. So they became asylees and they haven't gotten their papers yet. So they don't know what their status is and the university doesn't know. So the, um, their status is so complicated. And at the same time, the sample size, I have 17 students actually from Iraq, from Syria, and they're all immigrants. So, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, I couldn't interview all of them so far. Um, of course, there's the reason I separate them is because in literature, they all say academic integration, social integration, and they are different, both of them, because students could feel like, oh, in classroom, I can participate. I love working with the, with the students. I love working with the professors. Um, I feel engaged in class, everybody's listening to me. But once he or she leaves the classroom and try to engage with the community on you know, campus, everything is different. Well, I can't go, for example, I can't wear hijab and go to the rec center, for example, people look, start looking at me. Or I can't have, for example, if I go to uh, one of organizations, there's an organization from Middle Eastern, but there's no organization from North African. So they put us under one umbrella, Muslim students, international students and this is the aim of the uh, of the project is just we need to look at people as individual cases we don't we always put them as one label so so far from the from the interviews i have students so far felt they are academic integrated there's a sense of belonging academically but not socially they say once we take our classes we want to leave the we want to leave the campus because we can't find ourselves there we we can't even go and you know um uh, state our opinions about subject. We can't be part of a community or volunteer work because we're afraid of language barrier, of how they can perceive us because we're Muslim, etc. So yeah, so this is summary. Thank you. Yes, and, and thank you for that. And I hope you do get to interview and complete your work, but I think it's a, it's a rich study and Hopefully you'll, you'll be able to complete it, but it's still rich as is. So thank you for that. Um, I, I think that um, the idea- Thank of, you very much. The idea of the self-identity uh, comes back in one of the comments about, you know, it's at the center of the educational experience. And we had the session yesterday where we also people talked about this uh, idea of, you know, the researcher, positionality of the researcher, the biases of the researcher, the previous perceptions and all of that. How can we really balance, and maybe I'm, I'm stretching a little bit here, but how can we balance, because I'm interested in methodology, so I'm, how can we balance who we are with what, we, with what scientific educational research, if there is something called scientific educational research? I, I, I think if you have few words to say about that, we can, um, you know, end it with a, with a few uh, of the ideas. Oh. The... Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. So uh, for the for the case of the bias, qualitative, I mean, of course, qualitative is hard to separate bias from qualitative research. But for my case, I have credibility measures. For example, I have uh, peer debriefing and I had a uh, member check. So once I finished all the interviews, um, and an analyze them, two of other researchers, including my professor, she, they will separately write their own notes and their themes and we're gonna meet together. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, probably I have a problem with the internet. So then we meet together as a group and then we finalize the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 what the themes we are going to have in the paper. So the bias is there, it's hard to, yeah. And, and this is why I, as researchers, we have to mention our positionality, 
who we are so that we, so that readers understand who we, you know where we're coming from to understand well bias is there but we try to reduce it by having this and that yes thank you any anyone else would like to address this okay. question I guess I, I uh, the utility of the language, um, I, 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 I challenge to some degree because if we all have bias, um, what, what is the, the, the productive use of framing our inquiries around that, right? Um, we, we come into these questions with, with our perceived, conceived, lived experiences. We come in with the methodologies that we're steeped in, the disciplines uh, that, that we see through. We can talk about that. We can frame that. And as a, as a trained historian, that was uncomfortable for me early in my, my graduate career. I don't want to talk about myself being Pakistani, growing up in an immigrant family. What does that mean? How does that shape the way I approach the history of Muslim African Americans, right? Um, how does my own racial identity development relate to the way in which I'm trying to understand the intersection between race, uh, faith, and, and, and national identity? So the, the, the framing of that then also puts the positionality back on those that might traditionally have been seen as kind of colorblind, objective researchers. I think that that's, that's more compelling for me is for someone to be very reflective um, and reflexive about who they are versus the, I know that like the, the vocabulary of bias, it, it seems to be back in fashion, but, but I, I just, I guess I wonder what others think about this. Is it is it useful to you? Uh, or I think what Muhammad is framing is really I'm going to I'm going to be honest about who I am, where I come from, how I see, and and how I make meaning. And now through that lens, understand uh, you know the the data, understand the analysis, understand the outcomes. Thank you for that reminder, <laughs> Shelley and um, Becky. Last words. I like very much, um, uh, and thank you, and ag agree with that, uh, that um, question is bias something that um, we really want to look at. Um, and I guess um, traditionally I would have um, said that um, as a critical scholar, I've always thought that um, I, be on my soapbox uh, that we we are all, we all bring our biases into research, and it is uh, most important for us to reveal our own histories and our positionalities. Um, but uh, given the current level of white supremacy, the uh, materialization of um, militia, the uh, and the apparatus of the state in the United States uh, were, uh, I think that it's very important for us to um, talk about bias uh, from the standpoint of what is uh, so stark in the level of oppression. So I find that um, I, as a critical uh, scholar uh, that, uh, and movement activist, that I find that um, anti-bias work is so important, particularly we, when we can look at the intersectionality of resources and repression, the actual repression that is being faced, um, demon, the demonization that yeah. is um, present in our current realities. Yeah. Thank you. I feel like we can organize a whole session on, on this topic, the bias and anti-bias, but I would like to give Dr. Fox, uh, Professor Fox, the last word so we can conclude for today. Thank you. I, so I, I also hear the power of being able to express ourselves, try to express enough about our own biases that 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 information can help us move forward in new ways in our dialogue. And what I was going to say, because Shelly and I are close friends for many, many years, and um, I've learned so much from her and with her about our, our joint commitment to critical pedagogy and to crit taking those critical lenses 
um, Ilham, the same thing with you and, and with the folks who are, who are all here with us today. I think our results are really the beginning of further dialogue because we were looking for legacy and sustainability and perhaps the sustainability of anything um, might be measured in its ability to foster new conversations that might take us to new places. I think the world has a ways to go, don't you think? So. We sure do, we sure do. And I wanna know, thank you all for such a stimulating conversation. I've personally enjoyed it. I hope our audience did too, I'm sure they did. Thank you, Professor Fox, Professor Wong, and uh, not yet uh, ABD, Dr. Alhas and Dr. Hussein. Thank you and the team, Wumi and the others. Everyone, thank you for being with us. Don't forget to take the short survey. Tarek too, nice to meet you. And uh, please take the survey and thank you so much to our audience. See you tomorrow, even though it's Saturday, try to make it at noon tomorrow, Eastern time. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody, thank you. Thank you so much.